Okay, so this is the next project. Um, Ruth and I were at the Melbourne War Memorial Museum recently, and I was struck by some of the stuff from the World, World War I, which the soldiers carried with them in the trenches. And these are the bits and bobs I have got together um, for it. Um, the object that I'm gonna try and make was called a penny lighter. And this is how they looked. It's got a one penny each side and it's got a flint and a, um, a circular wheel and a wick. And um, this that's next to something made from a bullet next to it. So I've got a packet of lighter flints, a uh, standard Zippo type. You can see the little wheel there, which is the uh, for the flints to um, for the spark. I've got a hexagonal piece of brass here and I've got another piece of brass to make the various tubes. Um, and I've got a, a good quality wick, which is copper cord. I'm not sure what the copper cord is, perhaps it's something to do with the heat and making the um, making the lighter fluid vaporise easier. Anyway, might look into that. Uh, and the two pennies. When I was uh, in my early teens, I built an electronic metal detector and because nobody had metal detectors much at that time, I was able to find lots and lots of coins near our house. I selected two, um, which are both um, pre World War One. Um, this one's 1911, and it's got the king's head on. Um, who does that say? Uh, wherever the king was, George, I think. George, King George, on that one. And then this one, I've found, which is a little bit older, I think. Uh, 190. Something or other. And this one's got Queen Victoria's head on. So I think those will be excellent because they're of the of the correct era. And um and uh and the ones that I found so that's quite nice. I've had a look online and um these are some which more modern ones I think which are made for uh, but also penny lighters. Um I think here you can see the the filler cap. Uh, or the internal view of the filler cap for the lighter fluid. And this is the tube which the flint goes in. And there's a, a screw at the bottom, which, and I think a spring in here, which adjusts the tension of the flint. Um, and this is what it looks like on the surface. This is for the wick to come out. And this is the tube you saw earlier with the, uh, the flint underneath there, which you can't see, and the striking wheel on top. So um, all that kind of seems doable. Um, I'm starting to think about it in uh, end of May because I know how long these things end up taking me with all everything else considered. So um, yeah, we'll see how we go on that. And obviously there'll be a box to go with it, a suitable box to go with it as well. Okay. Oh, and the other thing I need to do is just research how the wick works and um, presumably it's going to be the correct fit inside the hole and um, what I don't want is um, to make a small <laughs> a small bomb full of lighter fluid fluid um, because I've got the the wick wrong and the flame goes back inside in some way so I need to I need to research that as well I think I've just measured um, these two pennies the 1899 Victoria penny and the um, 1911 George penny and surprisingly they're very round the George penny appears to be about 0 0.1 of a millimeter bigger diameter diameter the the Victorian penny but they're very very true circles which is surprising but um, after all these years you think they'd be bumped and bashed the edges are good so um, I've got good feelings about being able to recess them fairly accurately into the brass hexagon. And and then um, the whole of the lighter will obviously be soldered together. Um, I'm assuming these coins have got enough copper or brass in them that they'll be able to solder them in. Um, presumably that's what they did in the past. 
Um, so that's a that's a good first step um, in terms of the machining of it. So first up, I'm going to do a little experiment. Um, in the final project, I have to inlay a penny, an old penny. This is a George, I think, penny of 1913. Uh, because it's a similar sort of age and presumably a similar alloy. So in the final project, I have to inlay this into a, inset it into a piece of, piece of brass. So I've got a scrap of brass here and I've got to in, I'm, I'm just doing an experiment to see what the tolerances look like, first of all, and how to machine it. And secondly, then I'll, I'll inlay it in, in the, in the uh, socket and I'll solder it and just check that that is sort of watertight to make sure lighter fluid doesn't leak out. So I'll probably drill a hole in the middle and put it under compressed air, under water to make sure that I can make um, an airtight seal for the lighter. All right. I want the rebate there to be the same thickness as the penny. So what I'll do is I'll just, I'll run up the cutting tool so that it's just touching the face of the work piece. And then down here, um, there's an end stop. And you can see how it works. It just, you clamp it onto the rail and it sticks out and stops the carriage coming any closer. So with the tool on the end there, I will simply set this, set this gap. To sort of clamp my penny. Had to do it one hand. Yeah, the end stops clamping the penny there, so that gap is exactly the same thickness as the penny. So when I remove that penny, the end stop gap will only allow the tool to advance exactly the thickness of the penny into the work. Uh, that's my plan anyway. So the lathe is on automatic cross feed here. You can see it's got powered cross feed, which my other lathe didn't have, which will end up making a nice even finish on the brass there. I'm just basing it off um, at the moment. I might have to run it again because I don't think it's exactly right, but you can see the advantage of a steady, slow cross feed. So I measured the penny diameter which is 30.8 millimeters and I've machined this roughly um, and it's I've measured that to about 29 millimeters so I'm 1.8 millimeters too small at the moment so set up this dial indicator against the cross slide and I've zeroed it that is the tools that right on the outside of the circle so I need to bring it out 1.8 divided by 2 I need to bring this out 0.9 so I'll machine it out until this reads 0.9 millimeters and then I'll be just probably just about right for the penny we'll see So, let's check that. Beautiful, feels flush. No movement. That is a nice fit. And the machining technique, I think, is good. I have to practice everything, first of all, because I've only got one piece of hex stock to make the lighter out of, so I'd better not get it wrong. But that feels like a good fit, so we'll try soldering it next 
and see how that goes. You can see here, by the way, that we're using the four jaw chuck. This is the normal three jaw chuck that we use. And you'll see as we turn the knob, these all come in together. They don't all come in perfectly accurately together. And so the workpiece can be a little bit off center, which is why we use these collets if we want it to be really accurate because they will be completely on center. But the four jaw chuck has the advantage that each of the, each of the jaws is moved independently. See that? Which means, as in this case, that we can hold irregular, square, or any shape really, within reason, in the in the in the jaws. But it also means that we have to carefully position each jaw, and carefully the position the workpiece to the the position we want it relative to the tool which takes quite a bit more setting up than just turning turning the key and getting these all moved in together. So you can use the four jaw chuck um, on generally on shapes other than other than circles. Normally a collet or the three jaw chuck is more suitable, not always, but more suitable uh, if you're just machining circles. And this is the, the penny in better light. Um, that slight shadow you can see around the perimeter of the penny is actually the, the curved edge to the penny. It's not a gap. The thing really does fit tightly and I'm really pleased with that. And so I will just started uh, putting some emery cloth and polishing the edge of the penny so that it'll take the solder. I'll put some flux on both parts, heat it up and see how we go. So this is the coin soldered in. And I was able to put it under water and pump air into the back of it and no air came out from around the perimeter. So I think it's, I think it's airtight. Problem is that there was a lot of solder now to be cleaned up without damaging the penny. On the final job, I will be able to solder one of the pennies from inside. Uh, so that would only need one side perhaps to be cleaned up to this extent but now I need to try and work out how to clean it up without damaging the penny, get back to brass. It might be that I have to rebate the penny very slightly in order that um, I can clean it up, but then that would that would leave a bit of a, an edge around the outside, which I don't want, so I will see how we go. I'm just um, rubbing this on some scotch dries, which is a quite a mild abrasive um, and the problem here is that the, the, the penny is very very slightly raised from the brass and therefore to get rid of all the solder I'm going to be um, affecting the look of the penny especially the head it's come up nicely I think the better strategy when I do the actual piece is to recess the penny in by say 0.3 of a millimeter or something and then actually machine machine away that 0.3 of a millimeter in order that um, we also machine away the solder because although it looks okay now um, when the brass and the solder both tarnish they look very different and look awful so that's um, that's a lesson learned um, and, uh, and that's I think what uh, what this sort of test piece does is it irons out a lot of the possible issues. You can probably see the rim of the penny there is quite quite coppery colour, where um, 
because it's because it's proud and, and the head has, has been abraded a little bit uh, in some of the letters but um, I think uh, yeah it'll be a it'll be a better better thing to recess the penny in the machine away a small fraction of a millimeter